Well, a very good afternoon, and after a day off, welcome back to the Tour de Ski Stage 4 coming up this afternoon. Um, both men and women in action in the sprint event here, the second sprint of the Tour, a real opportunity for Usberg to make a little more ground on Therese Johag. Well, uh, we've been in uh, Lenzerheide for three days. The Tour has moved to the south of Germany, a venue that's hosted the World Championships before, so they'll be used to competitions of this side. Uh, Justina Kowalczyk has had good days here. Niki uh, Krukyov, Kriukov of uh, Russia also. Uh, Kowalczyk's not really here, Mike. <laughs> and Kriukov certainly isn't here. Well, no, Kriukov's having a bad season, and uh, Kowalczyk, wouldn't it be fantastic if she could get back to that old magic winning ways? I'd love to see that today, but no off form. Well, nice to see temperatures getting somewhere near zero. We're still, still on the wrong side of freezing. Uh, for this event and you can see just how soft that track is these guys have got a lot of work to do today if we're not going to get as many falls and there were quite a few incidents lots of surprises in the qualifying yes there were and uh, as you said the deepness of the snow in the corner the softness that is catching them out in the in the classic style here the course say uh, for the men has to have changed patrick it was supposed to be 1.5 but now they're on the same 1.2 kilometer track as the women and that's due to the lack of snow not a difficult course in terms of profile. You're only rising 20 meters on each of those climbs. The rest is relatively simple. I must say, I think uh, 1.2 is much more a sprint distance than 1.5. You won't get any track athletes who tell you that a 1500 meters is a sprint. Uh, but uh, skiing is slightly different. Speeds are slightly uh, higher. And uh, we've had some fantastic action so far this year. All the events in Lenzerheide, I think, considering the conditions, Mike, were brilliantly run. Uh, great atmosphere, good crowds. And at last, on Sunday, we got some sunshine. Yes, we did. And uh, a little sprinkling here of natural snow. So uh, they're on the edge of hopefully, hopefully getting their normal winter. Yeah, what's happening? A bit of natural snow. We've seen precious little of it this year. Well, we're going to pick up the action with the uh, start of the women's. Luckily, we're in time for the first heat. There's a familiar figure, Charlotte Caller, looking good. And uh, hopefully she can just uh, raise her game a little and challenge for a top three in the Tour de Ski come the end uh, of the week. Nicole Fessel, nearest the camera for Germany, 14th in the overall World Cup standings at the moment. Hasn't really featured in this tour so far. Palmakowski's had a, a good season, Mike. There she is uh, in the Finnish colours, bib number 16, seventh in the tour. It's good. I think we'll see the Finns, the Finnish girls, performing much better here in the classic style than last week in the freestyle sprints. So they're underway. The first heat of the women's, and uh, no surprise to see Usberg gaining ground on the two athletes on either side of her. Uh, Charlotte Caller knows exactly the best tactic, straight in behind Usberg. But look how strong Usberg is. Uh, such a powerful double polling action, Mike. And she is riding high after that victory on. Sunday over Therese Johan. Yeah, very much so. And, and she's got this energy, this read, this confidence where she can match and beat Johan, uh, well, the last race two days ago. And she seems to have, uh, I, I don't know, carried some extra confidence into today as well. Well, no one had got within 15 seconds of Johan in a 5K this season. Uh, Usberg managed to reverse the table. She beat uh, Johan by 14 seconds and got an extra five second bonus. So uh, she did herself no harm at all. And the margin now at the start of the fourth stage, 14 seconds. Uh, and I guess having been singing the praises of Johan all the way through the tour, Mike, and saying no one else has got a chance of winning this year, uh, Johan's still favourite, but we have to start discussing what Usberg has got to do over the next four stages. Oh, Kala Charles and Charlotte Kala has gone down. The second fall, and that uh, is Matt Vieva of Russia who's oh, taken a tumble. Three. And another. So you're not out of this if you take a fall. That's exactly the part of the course we saw them working earlier, and we had a lot of fallers, as we mentioned, in the. Uh, in the trial round, the qualification, Usberg cleanly through. Now, Usberg, if she's aware, of, I'm not sure she's even looked behind her, but she should realise that she may want to back off. It's only the first two guaranteed to go through. It's just the skis flipping. 
Yeah, the, the left ski went across the right ski for Charlotte Caller. Uh, she limited the damage, but was slow to get back on her feet and going down. Ida Sargent of USA. And I think, uh, to be honest, Nicole Fessel uh, slightly psyched out by the fact that she'd already seen three tumble. Look at this. It's only at Usberg, Parmakowski, who didn't fall. The rest took a, a slight uh, knee down or hip down on that corner. Now, I don't remember a time when Usberg has looked behind her in a race. It would pay dividends here because she's got, she can cruise to the finish. Absolutely essential. She doesn't put a sprint on in the last 200 meters. But I, I'll tell you what, Patrick, with this course, it's, the, the, the reason the finding is so difficult is because it's, it's, it's so, so, way, soft. so soft. Yeah. But I yeah. think they've also put some salt on to tighten up parts of it. So you're getting this contrasting well, soft and then uh, hard top. Well, that might well be the case, but uh, if so, they put the salt on too late. Uh, it would make it an incredibly quick course if they salted the whole thing. Uh, we are going to see more drama here in uh, Oberstdorf, and I just get that sneaky feeling it's going to have a big effect on the way the tour turns out. So Osberg comes in, 2.48, uh, 10 seconds slower than her winning... Uh, in fact, she was, did she win? She did win the qualifying. She, she did. She uh, won it by a long margin yeah, as well. It was well. the men's that produced a surprise. Yilai. Yilai. Yilai getting uh, the win for Finland. What a pity for Gala, Patrick. That is such a pity. She's uh, she's doing so well the Tour de Ski so far, and that is going to set her back. She's yeah, fourth, fourth overall. Fourth place, fourth, four, uh, 245 off the pace of Usberg in the Tour itself. She's not going to be happy. No. She's definitely the not happy. The following smile has gone. Nicole Fessel putting a brave face on after her tumble. Now... Tactically, Mike, or let's say technically, how would you negotiate this deep snow? Well, I, I tell you where you want to be, safest place out front, and then you can dictate. I would even go out and try and get out front but, and be careful down that first run. Because as soon as Kala went down, it put the fear of life into the next three that tumble down behind her. Yeah, it's all about step turns in these sort of conditions. You don't try and skate too much. Uh, you certainly don't want your skis too close together. Usberg didn't have uh, too many problems, but she did look slightly nervous on the last of the downhill sections. And with the deep snow, snow plowing to, to kill your speed is so much more difficult. Look how wide Usberg's skis are. One in the track, one outside. That's sensible skiing. Yes, Kala's skis just flipped across, or left ski flipped across uh, her right ski. Carnage. Yeah, Fessel catching the left ski in the soft snow on the left-hand side. This is, uh, it's going to be entertaining for everyone except the athletes involved. <laughs> so heat two, who is going to tumble? Who will survive through to the finish? And uh, your chances, if you do get through to the finish without a fall, you've got a pretty good chance of uh, getting through to the next round. So let's have a look at those involved. Fastest qualifier in this second heat, Sandra Ringvald had a really good qualifying run. 2.38.72, only uh, half a second or so slower than Usberg. Sophie Caldwell of the United States, three Americans involved in the knockout stages. Slightly bizarrely, Bjornsson, one of the best sprinters, has not made it. She had problems on the course, uh, and that is a big blow to Bjornsson. Well placed in the overall World Cup in 12th, also uh, up in the top 10 of the Tour de Ski. So uh, a bit of blow for the Americans. Uh, let's hope that Sophie Caldwell or, of course, uh, Jesse Diggins can come, do and, come through and do something. 28 nearest the camera, Anouk Fever-Pisson from uh, France and Niskanen of Finland in there as well, wearing bib number 23, second from right as you look at them at the moment. And uh, Denise Herman, the only other one we haven't mentioned, right in the middle of the picture and she'll uh, try and team up with Sandra Ringvald. They've done exactly that, good skiing. I'm a little surprised uh, on the far right side, the tall figure of Nielsen. She normally gets a good start, but she was caught sleeping on the line. And that's uh, tactically now, she has to change her strategy. The fastest day uh, on paper. Nielsen who won the sprint in Davos earlier this season. Uh, Davos at altitude, and we're not at altitude here uh, in Oberstdorf. Davos also a freestyle sprint, so we can't use that as too much of an indicator, but it does tell you that Nielsen is a good sprinter, and she needs a couple of good results. Lying, uh, what is she, 14th in the Tour at the moment. Uh, I think you were 
probably uh, with me Mike thinking she might be top five or six at this stage well that's right uh, I don't know what's going on but uh, Sophie Coldwell on the other hand uh, has impressed me throughout her sprinting and the confidence seems to build every single day she races and why not the results are getting better and better this is the tricky descent so here we go and I'm not sure this second heat had uh, too much of an indication looks as though they've done a bit of work on uh, the course already they have scraped a bit of snow off the top and everyone safely through on this occasion it, it looks a bit ragged coming down there but the skis are only four centimeters wide they're doing over 65 kilometers an hour the camera makes it look quite easy but it's quite technical and fast well this is a fine attack up this climb from Ringwald. Well, that's a really strong ski from her Nielsen has gone with the leading two tucked in behind Sophie Caldwell of United States and uh, these three will be fighting it out for the two positions short sharp strides from Ringwald and she's getting good grip on the skis but will that mean she has a slightly slower descent Ringwald leading Coldwell second Stina Nielsen of Sweden cannot afford to be knocked out at this stage but there doesn't look to be too much fight in Nielsen at the moment a good downhill section could get her back into contention for a top two. She's still with it. With these soft conditions, it doesn't allow you any relaxation through the legs. You've got to be braced, you've got to be reactive, and uh, tension through the legs throughout. Nielsen nearly yeah. fell. Looking for some space. Now she has to move to the right-hand side, and again, it's been a scrappy finish from Nielsen, and that little stumble could cost her a position in the final two. Couple of skate steps to get herself into the track. I think that will be permitted. And Nielsen coming strong in the final stages. Colwell blocking uh, Ringwald of Germany, and it's Sophie Colwell who gets the uh, win and the woman who was second quickest in qualifying Sandra Ringwald is now in uh, limbo she has to wait and see whether she's quick enough it might well be quick enough to go through Mike I think so when you look at the previous heat 245 248.5 this heat was 247.6 so at the moment looking good for Ringwald and, and that was a pretty much attacking Heat, uh, of course, Usberg uh, outskied the third place in the qualifying by almost three and a half seconds, so she really is setting the, the, the real form. And Ringwald, uh, her time the same as the winner of the first heat, so she could be lucky come the end of the day. Very good start from Ringwald. That was lightning quick off the blocks, got good grip on the skis from the off. And glad to say that they all made it round the tricky corner. Here's another slow-mo. Great technique from Ringwald. Really low, knees forward, hands forward. Uh, it's when the knees get behind the ankles that you know they're in trouble <laughs> because you've virtually lost all control of the ski. So the knees have to be forced forward. And, it, and, and so much of it's about positive, believing you can get around the corner. Very, and as you said, and it allowed Ringwald, there she is, the advantage to, to exit that bend so much faster than the rest to get the good attack up the second climb. Good ski from Sophie Coldwell, though. Uh, we were hoping for something special from the Americans, and that's... Uh, one of them through to the semi-finals here in Obersdorf. So Ringwald Hermann, the lucky losers, the two Germans at oh. the moment. I can't see Hermann going through seven seconds off the pace of uh, the leader in that heat. So heat three, Kolb, Hager, Kiloinen, Sevesek, settling there for Sweden. And uh, Zambalova for Russia, or Zambalova, we should say. Now the Russians, uh, only two Russians qualifying for the knockout stages, 11 nations in all, Germany with six competitors in the last 30. They've had a good day so far. Rugendhill Hager, 10th in the tour standings, 11th in the overall World Cup standings. Not a bad season for her. And Kiloinen, 5th in the overall, 2 minutes 52 off Osberg's added time and work to do for her but I think uh, a top five finish uh, I think uh, Kiloinen would have settled for that perhaps at the beginning of the tour I think so and they've, she did, they've produced a good result in the classic the distance classic and lends her height with a fourth position absolutely her strength classic with Matveva out for the Russians as you said only two Russians getting through to the top 30 I'm not sure we're going to see uh, them progressing into the semis good strong start from Kiloinen Finns seem to be getting better and better just in time for next year's World Championships. 
don't think we're going to see a scandal like we last saw in uh, Lati. When was that? Back in 2001? Yeah, I think they're still suffering from it. That's the, 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 yeah, that huge scandal at the time. The press still run them down to this day. And, um, and that's a real pity. That was in the past. And uh, a strong team, hopefully, for next year. With Eli setting the fastest time in the men's sprint earlier today, he'll have bib number one. And that's exciting for them. Last time the World Championships were held here in Oberstdorf was back in 2005. Uh, we had a classic sprint on that occasion as well. Vasily Rotchev won the men's and uh, Sweden with three of the top four. They only had four in the final in those days. Erstig, Andersson and Dahlberg all getting in the top four. Now they all saw the early fall, so they'll be a little frightened, a little nervous about this descent, but looks good so far. Well, they've certainly cleared a bit of snow off from that first heat. Um, they're going to have to keep working on that, no doubt about that. But those who went in the first heat can feel a little aggrieved. It was ankle deep down that particular descent. I did wonder what happened to Zambalava there, but she's back with it. She just lost uh, a little confidence coming down that descent. She's at the back now. Well, this is uh, very tight. This is anybody's. Uh, Kiloinen looking good, though, it really, isn't she? And Hager has got a good finish speed. Yeah, the summit of this particular climb, so important to be in a good position here if you're going to challenge. Uh, even if you're five metres off the pace, you may find you do not get another opportunity. Well, here's the second fastest descent. That's a nice picture, actually. It shows you exactly what they've got to do. Then they break to the right, and if they carry good speed, they'll get... Uh, a bit of free distance up the little climb that lies between them and the finishing straight. So Hager up and away for Norway. She should be able to secure victory in this heat. She's got a five metre lead at the moment and coming strong for the second time. Anne Kaloinen, who led the way out of the stadium at the start of this race. She's looking to secure second place. And then it's all about lucky losers time. 248.5. They need to beat if they want to go through as a lucky loser. And that is is not going to happen. Oh, Kolb came through so fast at the end, but if she had another 10 metres, I think she would have passed Kiloinen. It's all about timing. Good race from Hager there, Mike, uh, particularly the second half. It was a very... I think she paced, she paced herself. She tried to go to the front, saw she couldn't, so she took it easy the first half, came good in the second hand, half, and of course she is a, what, gold and silver medalist from the under-23 world champs. She's got a good finish speed. Hannah Cole just missed time that uh, finish. Wasn't a fast heat though, Patrick. 251.707. Slower so far. The next heat could be even slower. No one got into the top nine in qualifying from uh, the fourth heat. And Therese Johaug will be delighted that she chose heat number four uh, in her bid to make it through to the semi-finals. She'll be up next, crucial in terms of the Tour de Ski, Mike, because Johaug does not want to lose any more seconds to uh, Usberg. Not at all. I was just going through that in my mind. What is Johaug thinking right now? Because if someone goes down and they're ahead of her, she could be brought down. She will be thinking safety, because if she's down, she's going to lose potentially a minute. A, if she falls today, potentially a minute on Usberg. When you say she'll be thinking safety, are you implying that Johan will be happy that she's made it through to the top 30? She'll take a few bonus seconds, limit the damage that Usberg manages to do? Yeah, I think what I mean is she, she, she's got the 10th fastest time this morning, but she needs to go through. She needs to get more of the bonus seconds because there's 60 you. seconds to win. So she'll be careful, I think, because she'll be wanting more and more of these bonus seconds. I, I, I completely agree with you. I'm not sure she'll push too hard for the final slot, uh, but semi-finals would do nicely for Therese Johau. Johau second in the tour now, having held the bib on Sunday, but it was robbed from her shoulders by the best performance of the season by Ingvild Usberg who has already raced and made it through comfortably to the semi-finals. Well, there is Joho. She looks a lot more serious. She's had, uh, what, 48 hours to think about that defeat and come back strong. We're going to find out what she's made of today. Jessie Diggins, always a big smiler. Is she going to be a big racer today? She's got some pressure on the right with Joho and on her left with Justina Kowalczyk, who was at one time the queen of classic sprinting. 
17th fastest in qualifying. Can you believe that? Where has the old Kowalczyk gone? So here we go. Hannah Falk also in there. Lara Monanen of Finland. And Lucia Scardoni wearing bib number 22 on the right-hand side of your screen. Monanen 19, Falk is 18. Kowalczyk, you'll recognize 17 in the black and red suit. Jesse Diggins of the United States in the uh, dark blue suit this time with the stars down that leg. And then Therese Johaug in the Norwegian colors and the black bib. Second place in the tour, Mike. Uh, I know, I know it's not quite as good as she would have been hoping for, but in previous years, she's been nowhere near uh, the lead at this stage of the Tour. Well, that's right, not renowned for her sprinting speed, and but she's picking up speed now. She wasn't fast off the, the grid off the start, but wearing the black bib as she's hoovered up, picked up the most amount of bonus seconds during the Tour itself. I thought Kowalczyk, bib 17, I thought once she gets up to speed, I thought these difficult conditions would suit her but she's, what, in fifth place at the moment. She's just such a fighter as Kowalczyk, and the last time she raced here or in the Tour de Ski, she won it, season 2012. So here we go, this is the tricky downhill section and it's a much tighter race than we oh. saw last time. There's the first faller ah. and Johan, good footwork from her. Oh. No panic, she sails through past the Swede and past uh, number 11, that's Jesse Diggins who went down as well. And uh, Hannah Falk just lying there, I think that is frustration rather than injury. It didn't, it didn't seem like she'd injured us, but the door opened wide. Couldn't have yeah. been a better opportunity for Johan. Wow. Look, she's taking it. Yeah, the luck going her way today. Now she has to capitalise. She has to capitalise on this. Well, Jesse yeah. Diggins is out of it. There's no way Falk is coming back from that mistake. And actually, Mike, uh, just remembering the first heat when they fell, they were all on the right or the left-hand side. So you want to be in the middle. All the soft snow's gone to the side of the track. It said has it, and, and uh, the, Therese Johaug was playing a little safe. Good spread, good wide legs. She was ready to react should anybody go down, and she reacted so well. Johaug playing it safe at the start of the corner. She uh, might regret that if uh, Kowalczyk comes through and Monanen might catch her if she can carry good speed into the uphill. Good work from Jesse Diggins to get anywhere near the top two, but surely that fall has cost her a chance of going through as a lucky loser. It's Johau ahead of Kowalczyk. When have we ever said that in a classic sprint? <laughs> it's happening today. You have to believe your eyes. The fallers have got something to do with it, but take nothing away from Johau's performance. She was the one that had to take the evasive action on that first downhill. And she streaks ahead through to the semi-finals and the damage limited. You saw the celebration as if she's won the event. That means a whole lot to Johau. It does, and, and I think as we said, she just wants those bonus seconds place she's not a renowned sprinter but i tell you what she was very lucky that the two of her header went down yeah she wants her second tour title she wants it badly <laughs> uh, she's, she's, she's still <laughs> she's still on adrenaline mixed feelings in the norwegian camp but because i'm sure that there are those who want usberg to win the tour and those who want therese johan to win i think it, i think they want to make it exciting and if, if johan picks up a lot of these bonus seconds today it'll be a less exciting uh, final what four days well well done to Falk for finishing. If she hadn't, she'd be down in 30th place, as Andrew Young knows from uh, his expense last week in Lenzerheide. If you don't finish your heat, you go down to 30, regardless of how well you qualified. And incidentally, Andrew Young has not made it through today. This, these soft conditions, Mike, absolutely what he doesn't like. Just a real pity, and he was 31st, the top 30 going through, he was just outside qualifying. So disappointing for Andrew Young and the British team. And Andrew Musgrave, likewise, not going through. Now, let's have a look. Have a look on the right-hand side of the track. I, oh, well, and that, well, that was a case. That was a case of uh, Falk hit, going into a snowplow and, and Jesse Diggins going over the skis. Have a look at this. Falk goes into a snowplow. The ski goes under that of Jesse Diggins, which takes all control away from Diggins. And they both go down. Johaug, though, saw it coming. Quick step to the left. I love Jesse Diggins' attitude. She took a real impact, but she was straight up and straight on with the race, just hoping to get back into it. Well, I'm afraid That's... Falk has no one to blame but herself. If she'd kept the skis parallel, she would have made it round. And uh, Therese was braced. She didn't put too much of a snowplow on, but she was braced for any action, any 
anything happening in front of her. She gave herself an easy journey from there on in. Well, if Norwegians have had a weakness over the last decade, it has been the uh, some of the downhill sections of the course. Bjorn Daly, I think that was his only weakness, was the really fast technical sections. So there you see uh, confirmation, Johan Monanen are through. Uh, Kowalczyk at 3.5 behind is out. Another slow qualifying heat of 2.51. We're really looking for a time of around 2.47. The first heat, the fastest so far, despite uh, the fact that we lost three skiers. So, heat number five of five in this first round. Ingmar's daughter, Heidi Veng, still in the top three of the standings. Oshashkova, Anger, Grohova, and uh, last of all, Stephanie Buller of Germany. So, two Germans, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Norway, and Sweden all represented in this one. Ida Ingmar's daughter, Mike, uh, 13th in the tour. I thought after what we saw from her in Ruka, we might see something a bit better, but fifth in the sprint standings. Heidi Veng. Heidi Veng, she hasn't gone her way entirely, but it's certainly in this heat, uh, I'm looking for her to take this victory, barring a fall. 21, Lucia Anger of Germany. Again, she has uh, one of her teammates to work with, Stephanie Bola wearing 29. Prashashkova of Slovakia. Take your position. And then Grohova of the Czech Republic Set. in bib 26. Safely underway and not a bad start from Ingmar's daughter. She'll be happy enough with that. Wearing bib number five, the fastest qualifier in this heat, uh, but only a fraction of a second ahead of Heidi Veng. And Heidi Veng matching the Swede as they come out of the flat and start the first climb. A lot of double pulling. Very flat this first uh, 30 seconds or so, and then there's a little descent before the huge climb. Now, one thing I haven't seen, you, I, you will have watched a lot of alpine races, Mike, and when, when you see an event going on or a fall or a particular part of the course, we often see shots of the coaches radioing back to the start gate just to inform the athletes where to be wary, where to attack, what to watch out for. We haven't seen that here, and I wonder whether the, the teams have sent uh, a, a representative to that downhill section just to try and work out the best way of negotiating it. Do you know, I think you're right. Uh, there's certainly the coaches, uh, there's the coaches on the top of it hill um, with spare equipment should that happen but I think you're right I, th I think in between the heats they'll be telling our athletes okay play safe go down the middle line on that on this descent it's a safer line rather than the edges Ingmar's daughter is the first to try in this heat she makes it look easy Heidi Veng tempted to go into the snowplow but thinks better of it all six safely down and a lot of that's got to do with the fact that they were well spread out at the start of the descent plenty space all around and thinking space Ingmar's daughter is absolutely attacking this, the first of the two big climbs Heidi Veng will be happy with second it's all about going through to the semi-finals. If Veng is going to challenge for the title this year, she's got to start making ground very, very quickly. She's uh, lost a lot already. Line third, two minutes 13 off the leaders. May not sound a lot, but uh, this time last year, she was a minute, uh, what was it, a minute 10 behind, and then uh, was a minute 34 after the fourth stage. So she knows that uh, two minutes, 13 seconds, is a massive margin. It is. It's hard to put, if not impossible, to pull back. So second descent. Then not looking like someone who spends every day on a pair of skis. That's uh, not to say she can't ski brilliantly, but just to say that she's nervous. Very nervous, and I think that, that there is a lot of fear. If you fall, you're out. So they're all aware that they've got to stay on their feet, and, and that changes their freedom their flow and their technique they have to be careful rather than attack well there's no need for a sprint uh, from Heidi Feng I think it's going, to be, sorry, it's going to be the fastest heat though I think Patrick so we might see uh, lucky losers coming through from here well, they're quite a long way behind 248.5 they need to beat and uh, with Ingmar's daughter on 248.5 I'm not sure is Prashashkova going to make it on 252 at the moment she's got the green light and that should mean she has made it through we will double check on that Anger is not going to make it on 255.8 so I think third place in the first heat and third place in the fifth heat should be the two lucky losers
Welcome back to Oberstdorf, stage four of eight from this season's Tour de Ski. The highlight of the season, without a doubt, with no major championships this year. Here's a man who has shone from day one, Sergei Ustiagov, a very good sprinter, and he proved himself in the 30K, and he's kept himself up in the top four of the rankings of the Tour de Ski. Federico Pellegrino now, I think, uh, can safely claim to be the world's best sprinter at the moment. We'll see how he gets on today, whether he can cope with the downhill as well as the uphill. And also in this first heat of the men's, we have Rastelia Vitli, Surota of Norway, wearing 24. 25 is Len Valius of Canada, and Jauha Yerby of Finland making a rare appearance in a knockout sprint. He's in bib number 26, just cutting across into the middle lane. Just looking, Patrick, although there's bib 8 and to 26 in this first heat, there were only 1.96 seconds separating them an hour and a half ago in the qualifying times. So it's going to be a tight heat. A relatively pedestrian start, Mike. Su uh, surprising. And during the break, we were discussing the merits of getting out ahead before that first downhill. If you're first, firstly, you can see where you're going. Secondly, uh, you're not likely to have someone fall in front of you or obstruct you. So it has to be a big advantage. I think it is. And Ustigov, well, that's his, his style. He loves to lead anyway. And, uh, and I think that's why he's going to have his own, make his own decisions down the first descent. And of course, uh, as expected, Pellegrino's in there beside him. Maybe just get ahead of him, actually, on this descent. Ustia Goff looks uh, an immensely strong man in, in the upper body. Obviously, uh, legs and abdominals. Uh, your favourite uh, exercise in terms of the gym for boosting double polling strength? Well, uh, you get like, these machines, like rowing machines, where you can simulate the double polling action i think they're, they're excellent you get the resistance and it's a, a, a an even pressure throughout the drive double polling ergometer yes yeah. that's the word i was looking for you're after. <laughs> so second climb and ustigov still there pellegrino safely through no real problems uh, and, and i think one of the reasons for the difference between the men and the women coming down is that all the men attacked that downhill there was no one who went into the snow plow that's when you get trouble it is yeah if you cross those skis there in this soft these soft conditions have got a chance of flipping so happy to see uh, len valias there for canada hasn't had the form he's shown what two and three years ago but nice to see him sparking today alex harvey of course still in the men's tour de ski usually he's in the top three at this stage but currently lying in ninth maybe we're going to see better from uh, alex in the second half of this tour no this is tight this is very tight for the line valius on the right hand side pellegrino in the middle he's good when it comes to skating over the last couple of hundred meters what can he do in the classic ustiakov looks to be under control a glance over the left and he just draws clear with every double polling action and pellegrino may find himself waiting to see whether he's a lucky loser 228.1 for pellegrino that is the key time that's weird patrick the fastest finisher in the sport this year pellegrino and he didn't have a finish he didn't have another gear another turbo which he normally shows us every time he sprints classic it's all about double polling freestyle it's all about the lower limb speed and that is what he's got in in bagfuls well he doesn't have the dynamic arm power that he needed there today for those final five meters yeah valius looking uh, very very solid in his last 50 60 meters he he looked as though he knew he had the beating of pellegrino he was so good valias was so calm so composed i thought throughout that whole heat so there's confirmation 2:27.86, the winning time but 2:28.1, the time for pellegrino he too Polteranen, Iverson of Norway, Andrew Newell is in there for the United States, Emil Jonsson, a great classic sprinter, looking forward to seeing him in action, Nicholas Deerhaug of Norway, solid performance in the tour from him so far, and uh, of course, Morris Magnifica, who's uh, not really shown us his best so far in this tour. There's Polteranen of Kazakhstan, featured well in the 30 kilometer we saw in uh, Lenzerheide. Number four, fourth fastest in qualifying, 17th in the tour, Emil Iverson. He's got a few teammates to beat before he can think of winning this one. Six Norwegians qualifying in the top 30. 
Just under four seconds separating these six in the qualifying, so uh, we might see a bigger spread this time. Poltron in the quickest of the qualifiers, wearing three. Magnifica, nearest the camera, the slowest qualifier. What will his tactics be? Good start from Emil Jonsson in the middle. Well, he's setting out his stall early. He wants to uh, dictate things, Emil Jonsson. He'll probably slow it down uh, once he gets out of the stadium area. Made his way over to the right-hand side. That gives him a slight advantage on the first corner, but not at the top of the first hill. Emil Iverson looking comfortable, rides that first hill very smoothly indeed. Dear Haug in there for Norway as well. Iverson only 24. He's another one of these great finds for Norway. And Iverson on the far side looking for a bit of space. It's Dear Haug leading the way up the big climb. You can see where they've got to go down on the other side. And the cameramen really are in the wrong place. They want to be on that downhill. That's where the photos are that are going to get in the paper tomorrow. <laughs> Giant figure of Ibbotson. He, well, he's making his way to the front. He wants the space down this descent. Surprised that Jönsson is slipping a little there. The men, the men, very different to the, how the women attack that. Skis running parallel, no fear, just cracking on with it. Everything going Norway's way at the moment. Although Suerota in the first heat failed to qualify. Bustier Goff and Len Valia certainly through Pellegrino. The number one sprinter in the world having to wait to see whether he goes through to the semis. Emil Jonsson starting to make a move as they come to the top of the second climb. But he's struggling to stay with Emil Evelson at the moment, who still has a three, four metre advantage. Dear Hauger Norway in third place. In fact, uh, is he going to drop down a fourth? No, Dear Hauger still there in third. I thought we'd see more from Paul Tarainen, but I still think he's a very good finisher. I still think he can come through, maybe get up into third. Second even. Andrew Newell's not out of this one either. He's in fourth place at the moment. Now we start to see a move from Kazakhstan's Alexei Polteranin. He goes route wide on the outside. Everson, too good for everyone at this stage. Good tactics from him. He took it easy early on. Coming strong in the closing stages. Dear how Norway should be one and two. Jonsson, no reply. Polteranin, a really oh. quick finish, but he's left it too late. And he finishes in 2.26.7, which is good enough to make him the top player. That lucky loser and Jonsson on 227.1 is also a lucky loser at the moment. His fortune might change with well, three heats still to go. Well, Paul Tarainen, he just he was roadblocked. He had the pace, but he just didn't have the track to get through. But I think this, that'll be one of our faster qualifiers. You can't leave it too late. You've got to be in the race third or fourth into that home 200. Everson obviously saving something for the latter stages. Andrew New, the nearly man, so often threatens. And, uh, the American team slightly weakened um, Simi Hamilton uh, on the start sheet earlier this morning, but didn't make the start, so clearly unwell. And he's, he is the out and out renowned sprinter as well. Yeah, Clarison of Norway also withdrawing from the tour this morning. Those were two uh, late withdrawals as we have a look at some stats for Martin Jonsrud Sumbi, 130.2, the biggest gap ever in the Tour de Ski before the uh, finishing stage. And uh, Sumbi, remember, has already won it twice the last two years. He's looking to make it three out of three. He'll become the only man to have won three in succession if he can achieve that. And you know what? I wouldn't write him off whatsoever. It will be interesting to see how he deals with uh, this one when he's got two of his own teammates in the heat. Finn Hagen Kroc, and next door to him, Martin Jonsrud Sundby. And uh, he looked good in the sprint in Lenzerheide. He still looks very fresh, despite what he's done over the last few days. 
with a, with a minute 30, Mike, he, he's, he's in luxury land, isn't he? He can decide, OK, I'll, I'll get a few bonuses and I'll, I'll maybe get through to the semi and not push too hard. You feel he's more competitive than that. You think he'll go for the win? I really do. I think he'll just be all about attack and getting through to the next, getting through the semi-final and then getting... Well, there he is. He's setting out his stall early with a, a huge start. Yes, I think he, he's programmed. And he did say, he says, I don't do 1,100 hours uh, to, to approach each race uh, haphazardly. He says, I only want to win. So that's exactly what he's programmed to do today. But I, I guess what I'm implying is that maybe he'll treat this race as the tour as a whole. And his best chance of winning the tour is perhaps not to go through to the final and have a 100% have a effort final here. Bearing in mind, we've got a, what, a 15K tomorrow. On the following day, we've got another 10 kilometer race. I'm with you. I mean, he can play around. He's got such a big cushion there. You could build a strategy in, but I think he's just so good that he'll be out to win this one. Well, he's looking good at the moment, leading the way ahead of Finland's Ristamati Hakala. And uh, first on to the downhill. We haven't seen a faller in the men's race so far. Do you know, this is the fastest by some four seconds to the top of that first rise. Sunbi has attacked and attacked and attacked very early. He even admitted, <laughs> and of course he was, to being tired after the first three days of the tour. And if he was tired, everyone else is exhausted as well. Yeah, the altitude of uh, Lenzerheide getting the better of some of the athletes. Good tempo shown there from Sumbi. He has a good long look over the shoulder, pushes again. He's uh, certainly not going to hang around. He wants a place in that semi-final. And at this sort of pace, he's going to get it with uh, consummate ease. Hakala, still the man pushing him. Struggling a bit is Volzentseth of Russia, what, number 27. There's a big gap back to 18, which is Maxim Vilikshanin of uh, Russia. The two Russians blown away. And you only have to go back to 2010. 10, when virtually no one could touch the Russians in a classic sprint. In this race, they took all top four positions in the sprint competition. Yep, they did 2012. But uh, not there at the races. This has got to be a fast heat, though, Patrick. I think I had it clogged to four seconds early on. He's backed off a little now. 2.27 is uh, a good time. Anyone under 2.27 has a chance of going through as a lucky loser. Subi now trying to conserve a little bit of energy. He's done enough. He can cruise through to the line. And 2.25. Oh. Now, that is not the best way to win a sprint competition, to produce by far and away the quickest heat. It's not. A, well, as I say, four seconds, that's expensive. He will be suffering now in terms of recovery through to the semi-final. Finn Hagen Kroch goes through uh, at the moment as a lucky loser. And I think he has pushed Emil Jonsson off the pile because Jonsson was fourth in the last heat. He has. So Jonsson is out in the very first stage. One of the best classic sprinters. I'm, I'm a little surprised. Well, we said that he's only programmed to win, but his strategy, if he'd maybe hidden in second place or third place and then to save that energy for the semi-final, because he looked exhausted there after this one. Do you think this course is harder than the one we had in Lenzerheim? I think it is, because you've, you've got to place yourself so well. So from the gun, you've got those first 40 seconds where you're killing yourself to fight for your position. Then you've got that horrendous climb and then with the difficult track anyway, I would say it's more, more difficult. <laughs> Pulse rate back down to 90 before he's even crossed the line. <laughs> he is in peak condition. Well, there you see the course, obviously, apart from the big hill, which is uh, where the camera has taken this shot from. But a good view of the finish. Two fifty six fifty seven. Now uh, the time required to be beaten. If you want to go through as a lucky loser, who is it going to be from this heat? Heat number four of five, and it contains uh, some hot shots. Alex Harvey is in there. Crucial crucial for his uh, tour effort that he gets qualified for the semi-final alongside him a man who qualified a little bit quicker Sebastian Eisenlauer and then Petter Nortug he'll pull some tricks but predicting what he's going to do almost impossible <laughs> De Fabiani he's had a great tour hasn't he the under 23 World Cup leader De Fabiani 
really impressed. He struggled in the 30 kilometer, no doubt about that at the end. Uh, but, a, a, you know, the, the initial stages of that race, he looked very confident, very competent. And then number 29, without uh, thousands of fans to support him as he had last Saturday, Dario Colonia of Switzerland. The Take clock has started. Here we go. Heat four. Set. Colonia, the most successful tour ski skier in the history of the event. And uh, if you weren't with us last week, this is the 10th tour de ski. Winners, Angra, Bauer, Colonia, Legkoff, Sumbi. Not many in the nine, year, nine previous years and looking pretty good at the moment for Sumbi to take another. Well, this is an interesting heat. Uh, De Fabiani, the out-and-out -out strength is classic in his two techniques. Uh, I thought he'd start faster. Nortug dictating, doesn't often happen early on. Well, Nortug's the man in second place in the tour. And he needs some bonus seconds here. He needs to beat Sumbi uh, to give us any hope that we're going to see a fight on the El Chamis on the final day next Sunday. Yeah, very much. Yeah. Alex Harvey just at the back at the moment in red. Uh, he's, he plays clever. He never puts too much out if he can help it early on in these sprints, but a fantastic finisher, as is Nortug. Well, this is anybody's. I think Colonia's coming back into much better shape. Second fastest freestyle over the 15 kilometer. The 10 kilometer, sorry, two days ago. Now, Nortugget, he wanted to run it his way, but he's in third place now. Well, that's okay. He'll make his move uh, at some stage, and it looks as though he's up the effort, uh, the work rate on this second climb, just looking for a position at the top of the climb. Still Germany leading with uh, Eisenlauer, who was the second fastest qualifier in this heat. Nortug actually producing a time of 2.26.51, only a tenth of a second between those two. But moving well on the other side, Francesco De Fabiani, who's 13th in the tour standings. He's stolen a march <laughs> on Petter Nortug, and uh, that's going to make the Norwegians job that little bit harder. Oh, now the fast finishers uh, with Harvey, with Nortug, they really need to be careful, they're not caught out. They've opened up a little bit of a gap over Alex Harvey and Dario Colonia really struggling at the back, doesn't look uh, his uh, his old self Colonia, not happy with these conditions. Now Nortug looks for some pace and he's been squeezed out by Eisenlauer, but he's gone past the Fabiani without any trouble at all and now we see the double polling power of Petter Nortug. This is what why he has won so many major championships because very few can stay with him over the last hundred meters he's through to the semi-finals but he had to fight he had to really fight for that one he did he backed off only at the very end and, and what a turn of pace he still has the final straight there he just notched up another gear Alex Harvey is out 228.4 two seconds outside the qualifying time for the semi-finals Colonia is out De Fabiani is out Quickland wasn't quick enough and we have one heat still to go containing the very the fastest qualifier and uh, I don't know what the, the odds would have been for that but Marty Yilai certainly surprising most of those who were watching I think so he had the choice the first choice of whichever group he wanted in this qualifying and of course if you go one two and three you buy yourself more recovery time but he's taken the fifth option well that was a tight race up to the uh, halfway point and then uh, Eisenlauer was the first to put in a burst Nortug uh, pretty much in third place all the way through to the home straight, Mike. Well, he was uh, and just struggled on the second climb. When did you last see him ski like this? It's not skiing, it's running. <laughs> uh, world Championships. World Farmer. Champs, absolutely. He's not the world champion for nothing. Clever man, very good at strategy. Fabiani just completely running out of energy in the last 300 meters. 227.21, so still a good uh, couple of seconds, really slower than the heat we saw from Martin Jonsrud Sumbi. Is he going to get his first sprint win? It's possible on the sort of shape he's in. Maybe he will be tempted into uh, going all out in the finals should he get to that stage. We still have the semis to come, but this is the final heat. First round, 
Eli of Finland alongside Penson and his teammate. 2.23.99, Eli's qualifying time. Pensinen was some three seconds slower. That was the margin. I wonder whether Eli's got anything left for the knockout stages. Oskar Svensson is there for Sweden. Steriger for Poland. Andreas Katz of Germany near the camera. And then Levo Niskanen of Finland on the near side, the slowest qualifier. He was some six seconds outside Yilai's time. Well, there's some good leg speed from uh, Yilai. I think he's uh, put a weight of expectation on his shoulders after that qualifying display. Svensson of Sweden, happy to let the Finns go in front. And we have uh, a Finnish roadblock. That's uh, interesting, it's been a long time since we've seen the Finns uh, in this situation. Not saying it's going to last, but uh, hopefully for them it will. Sweden, we mentioned Russia, what, uh, 2012 in the men's field, taking the top four positions here. No Halverson, no Helner, they've had such bad health. Uh, although Halverson had a fantastic summer training, but just got picked up injuries and bad health in October, November. Oscar Svensson there in the big tall white suit. A good, good line round this corner. Penson and leading. And Finland still one, two, and three. I think that's Niskanen at the back. It is, and uh, he's doing a good job in holding off Svensson of Sweden, who finally finds a way through on the inside of the turn. But the gap's uh, as big as we've seen in any of the heats so far. And Einzi Pensinen, the man who leads the way at the moment. A good uh, burst coming from Marty Yilai, who would be embarrassed, I think, if he didn't get through to the semi-finals after his performance in the heats. Svensson's not out of this one. The tall figure in the white suit of Sweden. Well, Yilai is on absolute limit to get this first uh, position down the final descent, and I think he's, he's bought himself a good position there. And the two Finns attacking the top of the hill, Mike, in the first stage of the downhill. Not saying that Svensson didn't, but I think Svensson put such an effort in on the climb uh, that he found himself some five, six metres behind, but he's uh, descended well, took that final corner very neatly and has carried good speed. I suspect he's got a decent pair of skis on his feet and that could help him in the closing stages. Svensson coming through, excellent skiing from the Swede. And uh, which one of the two Finns is going to make it at the moment? It's Yilai in top spot, but coming strongly is Pensinen, who might steal it on the line. And the fastest qualifier is out well that can happen when you put so much out so early on in the race he did the fastest man from this morning will he be out there at 228.3 he might get through as a lucky loser good skiing from Svensson 227.7 has got him through to the semi-finals Welcome back to Oberstdorf, uh, Krug and Volt Senseth, the, the two lucky losers from the men's. That's just been confirmed as we switch back to the women's race through to the semi-final stages. This the fourth stage of the Tour de Ski for 2016 and four more stages to go after today. Usberg, the out and out favourite for today, looked very good in her semi-final uh, and had no hesitation, Mike, electing to go in heat number one and give herself the maximum rest before the semis and then before the final as well. Coldwell, she looked impressive as well. She might do something in this semi. And Stina Nielsen, who desperately needs to be in the last six to give herself a chance of finishing in the top five of the Tour de Ski. Palmakoski, it's been a good tour for her so far. Good season. It has, it certainly has. She wants to pick up as many bonus seconds though today, she says. Elena Prashashkova, now she raced in heat number five. Uh, it's going to be a remarkable recovery if she's got herself back in shape for this semi-final. She's had, what, 10, uh, 15 minutes less than Osberg to recover from the first effort. It's a huge factor, it really is. We've known this since uh, the sprinting came out and it's much easier on your body to buy that recovery time. 10 minutes is vital. Busberg with a white headband on, on the far side. 
Norway also hoping that Rodenhild Hager can make it through with a slightly uh, more voluminous ponytail in the red Norwegian suit. The Americans with Sophie Caldwell, Mike, she, she looks strong in that last heat. She had to do a lot of fighting as well, but I, I wonder whether we're going to see different tactics from the women on that first downhill. I think we will. They've, they've watched the men, they've seen it on the big screen, and I wonder if that will alter their thinking. Usper is still trying to buy herself the safety up front, if she can, but Parmakorski pushing her hard. Nielsen coming through on the inside as well. Yeah, I think they push the pace even harder. I think Usberg knows uh, that the best, the best course of action is to get out in front before you start the first descent. That little slip won't help her cause. Almost at the top now, but she's still got Stina Nielsen on her left, and she's got Sophie Caldwell right behind her. Here we go. How many will snowplow? Caldwell is tempted. She's tempted, but. Uh, Stay strong, stay strong. They're all through, safely round this time. And a very different different approach, although they didn't attack the top of the hill like we saw the men. And I was thinking the exact same thought. There was no walk over the rise. I think in fairness, we saw the earlier fall of fallers. It was the women who led the heats out and, and the track has become a, a little more pressed in. A little safer to ski on. Short, sharp steps from Usberg. Uh, Mike, with, with a course like this where you've got two steep climbs and two fast descents, I often feel you can go, afford to go a little stickier on the wax uh, because the, the gradient on the downhill gives you decent speed anyway. That's my feeling as well, the very wet and warm conditions, but it seems that like Usberg at the front, she's slipping more, she's not getting as much grip this time as she did in her previous heat, so the technicians are working all the time at uh, adjusting and changing the wax if need be well this is where you want the skis to be gliding well and you want as little stick wax on there as possible because there's only one little rise to go over before they come into the stadium but another very positive performance by Usberg she's got Sophie Caldwell right on her shoulder which may make her sprint all the way to the line Nielsen digging deep closing the gap meter by meter but she's going to run out of time less than 40 meters to go and it's going to be Usberg who secures the win. Coldwell's not quite safe yet as Nielsen pushes for that line. The longer leg of Coldwell just makes it and Nielsen has to wait and see. 2.46.3 is not a bad time. That may well put her through as the lucky loser. Coldwell, again, the confidence, the, the self-belief that she can get through every single time. She now has landed as a, as a world top-class sprinter. No Keegan Randall this year, but... Uh, a lot of what we're seeing from the American team is a result of the success she's had over the last five, six years. That's right, and I, I noticed that she was out in Davos over Christmas with the American team and, of course, with them there for the World Cup. A little bit like Bjorgen, she was training with the Norwegian team right the way through to the beginning of December. And I think we'll see Bjorgen back by end of March racing. She had her baby there just after Christmas, her little son. Her name? Name escapes me at the moment. A little baby boy. Well, our congratulations to her. Um, it is tough coming back, but we've seen some remarkable efforts over the time, particularly in biathlon. Marie Donat Abert, who uh, came back and got double gold at the World Championships. So and don't put it past Marit Bjorgen. Absolutely. And look, Greta Poiré as well on the biathlon side. She was back within, what, four months uh, back to competing after giving birth. So there's confirmation of that first semi-final. Usberg and Colwell can now prepare for the final itself. Nielsen and Hager will have to wait and see. Very often the first semi-final is quicker than the second, so they may feel confident. A little bit of blue sky for semi-final number two. I haven't seen any sunshine as yet but we don't really want any with the snow so soft but we could do with clear skies overnight to allow the temperatures to drop well below freezing and harden up the tracks for tomorrow therese johaug seldom makes the final of a sprint do you know i don't think i've ever seen such a, a focus from johaug no doubt about it that uh, that defeat on sunday could turn out to be a good thing heidi vang Alongside her, Ingmar's daughter, tall, strong, powerful, determined. And 
Kilkoinen. Looks reasonably relaxed, but she won't be once the gun goes. She went off fast in the first heat. Lara Monanen with her teammate alongside her. And on the far side, Sandra Ringwald, who put in a very good qualifying run, qualified second fastest, chose to go in heat number two. So she's had uh, a good rest between the heats and the semis. That could be her ticket through to the final. So Veng, Johaug, Ingmar's daughter, Kiloinen, Monanen and Ringwald. Two Norwegians, two Finns, a Swede and a German in this second semi-final. They will be going through to meet Usberg and Coldwell, but they're going to have to do a time of just under 246.2 if they want to go through as lucky losers. Well, without the sprint, uh, which Juho uh, doesn't have, she is at the back at the moment. Now, a lot of traffic ahead of her. I wonder if she'll be going into a little bit of tension, a little, little bit of panic. How do I get through this lot? Well, this is her chance to come through on the uphill climb, but she's got her teammate uh, in front of her in, the, in a sprint race. You can't uh, track the athlete in front. You can't ask them to get out of the way. You have to find a way round, and uh, therefore, Johau paying the price for being slower off the blocks than the others. Ingmar's daughter on the far side in white, uh, leading her particular column. What's, what's happened to Johau? Well, she's still there in second, but it looks to me as though... Ah, uh, yes, sorry. Well, yeah. she's either clogged up, uh, an extraordinary technique. I think she might have picked up a bit of snow on the base of the ski. Well, that's what I thought. Maybe some dirt, maybe some grass on the side of the track. Snow plowing it. Yo Haug in third place. Yeah, single leg snow plow. Now watch Yo Haug on the next climb. She might have shaken off. Sometimes the snow grips the clister, freezes on the clister. Uh, it's a bit like having a crampon on your foot rather than the ski. But she's recovered well. Now starts stomping away up the climb. And Yo Haug starting to. Uh, Put some pressure on the others. Ingmar's daughter holding the pace at the moment, still in first place. Norway with Heidi Veng in there as well. And Veng just extends it at the top of the climb. Uh, extraordinary race from Johan Mike slow to well, start with, brilliant on that second climb, but then fading towards the top. Very much as she had such a good exit speed from the, 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 the previous descent. Yeah, she's got to be more positive on the downhill if she's going to carry enough speed over the next little rise. Ringwald is there to uh, take her in the final stages if she doesn't uh, push hard. She's got in the slipstream of Ingmar's daughter. That's one advantage of being behind the biggest skier in the group. Still Heidi Feng leading Ingmar's daughter, Ringwald, Johan, a quality qualification for the final so important for all three uh, 234 on the clock at the moment they need to be just over 246 if they're going to go through as lucky losers and Johau coming strong takes Feng in the closing meters Ingmar's daughter's through and Therese Johau is through Heidi Feng will have to wait and see 247.1 I think that is a second outside but the very fact that her light has stayed green is an indication that uh, she's finished as the second fastest lucky loser. So Veng is through to the final. Look how much this means. She knows how much this means to not get any further de major deficit in seconds to Usberg. Usberg we know is through to the final and now so is Johan. Yeah, what a contrast. The reaction of the heat winner, Ingmar's daughter, cool as you like, to Therese Johan, who's made it through to the final, which means she, uh, whatever happens in the final, she has massively limited the damage that Osberg can do. Hugely, and on a mass start uh, tomorrow, what is it, uh, 10 kilometers for the women? Now, how much are you going to put on the fact that Johan will be Usberg in the final and be back in red for tomorrow? <laughs> I don't think so. I, I can't, I see, can't her. see her. I think she's happy just to make the final. And she so nearly fell down there, but her determination uh, kept her standing. Isn't it extraordinary how, as you get more and more nervous on the downhill, that knee flexion just turns into extension, <laughs> and the straighter your legs, the less control you have. Well, we've seen her win World Cups before, and she always celebrates, but I've never seen a race mean quite as much as this. Yeah, she knows that tomorrow she's got 14 seconds deficit to Usberg leading into tomorrow at the start of today, and she's going to limit that now. Who knows, she might even gain. 
if she wins the final. And she's never been in this position before, Patrick, a final in a sprint competition. So 60 second bonus for winning uh, after this event. Heidi Vang and Stina Nielsen, incidentally, the two lucky losers. So we're going to have uh, one, two, three Norwegians. 50% of the field in the women's final will be Norwegian. Two Swedes in there as well. And Sophie Caldwell flying the North American flag. Let's hope that she can spring a surprise. That would be a popular win. Well, nice to see a little bit of snow cover. And uh, we've only got a few seconds before the start of the men's semi. And already you get that feel of how little rest the men get between their heats and their semi-finals. It's uh, the short straw, I think, for the men going second. Can you remember a sprint when the women have gone second? No, always has been the men. Ustiagov, he's hungry, and when he's hungry, he's tough to beat. Noise, Emily Everson. Waited till the second half of his heat before he's really started to push. Len Valius, good qualification from Len Valius to make it through to the semi-finals. And Volsensev of Russia went in heat number three, so he's had a little bit of time to recover. Take your position. Valius was in the first heat, so he's had maximum time. And the fastest qualifiers on the far side. Good start from Ustiagov, as you would have expected. And Norway's Iveson looking good. Walter in for Kazakhstan with the blue and yellow. He's uh, let three or four meters open up. Slow to go into the two-phase technique there, Mike. That's it, on these short, short climbs. Uh, you have to decide when you're going to stop double poling and bring the legs into action. Uh, a little like driving, if you switch down gears too late, uh, you actually lose all that momentum. You do it, and the men's race, very different from the women's race, they carry that arm power, the double poling power, a further 15, 20 seconds down the track than the women, into the climb. And that's just the, the upper body strength from the men. It's sometimes not a bad idea, bad idea to bring the legs into play a little earlier uh, and save the arms for later on because you know the last 200 meters are all about arm power. Total arm power. Uh, what's happened to Len Valias? Not at the races. Is he playing the ultimate waiting game? <laughs> he needs to uh, get a little closer, but he, he looks so confident earlier. I think he looks he looks very tired despite the fact that he was in heat number one and should be pretty much fully recovered. It was a very good qualifying run. I think you'll come back. From really, uh, yeah. Often when they, and Ibbotson is just programmed to be the attacker all the time, and he sets this mega early pace alongside Ustigov. Ustigov there in eight. Just behind him is Emma Leverson, who was the uh, second fastest qualifier. Polter Arnin, actually, in the blue and yellow, was the quickest qualifier from uh, all these men. So uh, maybe he feels he's the man who has a right to make it through to the final. Just uh, 250 metres to go. A sharp right-hander, a little climb over the road bridge, and then a left-hander into the home straight. And it's still Ustigov leading. Polter Arnin in second place. The Norwegian, Emil Leverson, in third at the moment. And then a, a significant back, a gap back to uh, certainly uh, Len Valius is in fourth at the moment, and Finland's uh, Hakala. Ustiagov, when he needs it, he's got it. Polteranin will be happy, and Iverson has to wait to 27.2. Well, that's a fast uh, semi-final. In fact, that's the fastest outing we've seen in all the heats at 2.26.6 winning time. And Ustigov really went from it as usual from start line to finish line. And he'll do, he'll try and do the same again in the final. 
227.86. Ustigov in his heat. And uh, he's now produced a 227.2. Well, Len Valias didn't manage to come through, but you know that heat was so fast, although with Sundby <laughs> and Nortug in the next semi, it's going to be fast as well. Yeah, so lucky loser's time at the moment. 227.2 uh, would be the fastest lucky loser. Well, after his efforts in Lenzerheide in the first sprint, the opening stage of the Tour de Ski, Mike, I, I thought we'd see him fade at some stage, but it just seems to get stronger every day. He does, and he did this in Lenzerheide uh, on the first day where he, he led everything, and then in the final he was just pipped, just taken by uh, Pasini in that last five metres. Pellegrini coming through with uh, yeah another good sprint, but uh, I guess the shock of this men's race so far is the fact that Pellegrini went out in the first round. That was a surprise. Pellegrino just, uh, yes, I said Pasini, of course it's Pellegrino. He just ran out of steam uh, in the heat, didn't have the, the fight. Everson and Hackler sitting on the fence at the moment, waiting to see whether they fall into the final pool. Well, it's been a quietish crowd so far and um, part of the reason uh, the Germans haven't really been in evidence but they do have one of their own racing in this second semi Sebastian Eisenlauer and he looked good in qualifying he looked good in the first round heats hopefully his knowledge of this track will help today he's up against some pretty strong contenders Einzi Pensinen of Finland the only Finn in this second semi Hakala has already, well, he's virtually out. He is uh, the second second fastest lucky loser at the moment. Pena Nortuk, he's going to have to use all his guile, a feel, to make it through to the final. He does not want to rely on a lucky loser time. Oscar Svensson of Sweden. What time are they looking for at the top of the first climb, Mike? Top of the first climb, I think it's 52, 53 seconds. I've got 108 on the bottom corner, uh, just when they come off that first steep downhill and go into that left-hand bend. Sumbi, what will his tactics be? It's a very different course from the one in Lenzerheide, where he looks solid up until the final, with Pellegrino out of the way. Maybe he fancies his chance of a win. Finn Hagenkrok is uh, perhaps the most specialised of the sprinters in this particular heat. I think Sunbi's strategy, although he's in great company, I think he'll try and do the same, lead from the front. But for me, he looked a little tired after that last one. Three Norwegians. Sweden with Svensson, oh, Pensonen of Finland. And... Uh, on the Kroc. near side, that's Finn Hagen Kroc, who's made life difficult for himself. I can't see his teammates hanging around to wait for him. And uh, Nortuk straight in behind Sumbi. Those two, a massive rivalry over the last couple of years. And it's Sumbi who really has come out on top in everything except for the World Championships, where he went home empty handed compared to Petter Nortuk, who swept up. Not only did he win the sprint, Mike, but he also won the 50 kilometre. Quite amazing. But Petter Nortuk, uh, he was almost written off by even the Norwegian press. He had been a bad lad in the summer and uh, he came through, I think, just to show that he's still in the sport and uh, massively popular uh, after his, all his medals at the World Champs. Can you believe it? Finn Hagen Kroc has nearly made it back with the pack, but expensive to have to have <laughs> yeah. to, to lost three seconds. I was just going to say, that sort of a margin oh. doesn't come for three. He's put, uh, he's put the ski pole inside that right yep. foot. Yep. Yep. Classic, classic mistake. Easily oh. done, easily done. And he will not enjoy that video, especially if it goes on to Watts and gets repeated <sighs> ad nauseam. Well, he was up he was up quickly, but and there he is back at the back, but in contact contact with them. Well look at Sumbi Mike. Here he goes. Uh, he's not happy with a one minute thirty second lead in the tour de ski. Uh, I, I was suggesting at the start of the day that he'd be happy if he extended his lead over Pedanorton. But to do that, he might have to win here today.
Well, again, that, that glazed look up the track, the gritted teeth, a little look around, but nobody, nobody can match that pace. It's unbelievable. Yeah, he's, he will be enjoying showing Petter Norton <laughs> a clean <laughs> pair of heels. He's, uh, he's taken him on at his own gain and looks as though he's going to beat him here. Norton's still in third place. He's not out of this one yet. The uh, lucky losers from the first heat, what were they? 227.2 is what they're after. They need to be inside that to be certain of going through but this this is so fast patrick i think we're going to get the lucky losers all two of them eh, coming out of this heat well crook didn't work well again he failed here comes the sprint from Peter Nortuk. He needs to try and get clear of Eisenlauer of Germany. It's not going to be easy. And pressure coming from Svensson of Sweden as well. But Sumbi's going to wrap this one up. And Sumbi's presence could get in the way of Eisenlauer. It does. It oh. does. Now, will there be a protest there? I don't think so, because Sumbi was quite within his rights not to do anything over the last 15 metres. He completely backed off. Uh, yes, I, 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 there cannot be a complaint, surely, because uh, he was roadblocked. Eisenlauer, he could have made be leapt to the right or the left or certainly to the right and but I think they've missed the lucky loser time 226.64 the winning time in the first semi 226.99 so fractionally slower but it's Iverson's and Hackler's time that we're looking at but Jonsrud Sumbi, I mean, he backed off over the last well, 50 meters really backed off I thought he was going to be caught you have to feel that if uh, well Nautic's certainly going to go through if he's got this one have a look it's the transponder is just above the ankle. You can see it. I think Eisenlauer has got it. I think he has. And I think fact, Eisenlauer has got it. His timing was slightly better. It looked as though Nautic was going to outstretch him. Our camera shot made it look even tighter. I think it is Eisenlauer. All sorts of problems at the start. Svensson had problems as well. Well... Yeah. <laughs> That's what happens when you try and pick up three seconds early on. Nothing left. Well, give him credit for trying. It, you never quite know what's going to happen. Sometimes we see a, ca a game of cat and mouse, and those who've fallen do get back in. But it's a very, very rare occasion, and I suspect it will never happen when Sunbi is leading the way. He's, uh, he doesn't seem to be a man who knows what half pace is about. He has secured a place. Eisenlau has been given the win. Pedan Nortug in third, but he's gone through. Because he's got the same time as Eisenlau, actually, and he's gone through to push Hackler of Finland out of the competition. Emil Everson and Pedan Nortug, the two lucky losers, Sumbi, Eisenlauer, Ustiakov and Polteranin, the other qualifiers for the men's final. So, as with the women's, three Norwegians in the final. Don't tell me they're going to get another clean sweep today. It's been the story of the tour so far. Well, that finished, what, a minute and a half ago at uh, 13 minutes to the hour so we'll just uh, keep an eye on the clock and see how much rest the men get before the final the women have already had 24 minutes and certainly when you think of the men's race you've got soon be in that second of the semi-finals uh, nor to there much less recovery time is a factor going into the final What would your routine be between a semi and a final in terms of recovery? I think I would want to get onto, as, as so many of them do, get onto the, keep your legs moving, get onto a cycle machine, just uh, keep the legs turning. Uh, there's not really a chance to go out for a ski, but, uh, and also, I was going to say to relax as well, you just need to switch off most best recovery possible. You don't have much time, so you can't, uh, you can't really slip a pair of running shoes on and go for a light jog or anything so here's the final and we have the three best Norwegians Usberg, Veng and Johaug all in the final we also have Sophie Caldwell of the United States Keegan Randall I'm sure she's watching this and will be willing her teammate on the favourite to win this one, 
and extend her lead in the Tour de Ski, a slim 14 second advantage after three stages. Can she push it up to closer to 30 seconds? Ida Ingmar's daughter of Sweden. Didn't convince me in that semi-final, Mike, but We'll see whether she was saving something for the final. Final. Stina Nielsen went through as a lucky loser. Her time, 0.4 of a second slower than Usberg in that semi. And Therese Johaug. Can she win it? Do you know, she'll be thinking she can. And uh, she, uh, she's happy to be in the final, so that limits the loss of seconds to Usberg. Heidi Vang, who had a really good fight in that semi-final with Therese Johaug. Heidi Vang, in the end, going through as the lucky loser and actually the slowest of all the qualifiers from the semi-final. So we have qualifiers 1, 3, 12, 6. And uh, Stina Nielsen in the blue bib, the slowest of the qualifiers at the start of the day, but that really is uh, irrelevant at the moment. No surprise to see a big burst coming in from uh, Usberg. She'll want to shake off Johaug as early as she can. Johaug's only real chance, Mike, I feel, is on the second climb. She's not going to have any space on the first climb. Well, her cornering, if we watch this descent coming up in, what, uh, 20, 30 seconds time, Johaug was certainly the best at cornering, and she carried a whole lot of speed into the into the second big climb. That's the only slight advantage. She won't match them pace for pace. Well, I thought a downhill looked decidedly suspect in that she wasn't wasn't as positive as we'd normally see her. Uh, we'll see. Usberg, I think, uh, is brimming with confidence at the moment. Well, there's uh, Therese Johaug attacking, just running her way to the top of this one. Yeah, Sophie Caldwell's made a good move, tucked in behind uh, Usberg, who's the leading Norwegian on the near side. Heidi Veng going the long way round, but uh, it may be the best way at the moment. Ingmar's daughter well positioned in the middle, whether the turn goes left or right, she's in the right place. Johaug puts herself up in a fifth place, going ahead of, uh, I think she's just gone ahead of Stina Nielsen at the back now, and Nielsen goes down, forced onto that left hand side so close for uh Johau to go down oh. but nielsen's out of this one let's hope there weren't any injuries there she what, just needs to cruise what i think happened we did i saw you put the snowplow on i think yeah uh, look at the back there's you you how uh, slowed a little but no nielsen was yeah, independent into the soft snow on the left hand side we saw that in the early runs and uh, just shot across the tracks lucky for loha Johau that she was a meter or so in front Usberg still leading the last climb it's a big one and then they have the fast descent down to the little footbridge and into the finish Usberg looking for yet another win in the tour de ski she was second in the sprint in lenza hider behind her teammate faller but was given the uh, red bib as a result of faller drawing out of the tour de ski at that stage i think Johauga saw her back off first time in her life probably to back off but she knows she cannot match these sprinters and i think she'll be happy with fifth position well, with, with nielsen having gone down yeah. Sensible move in my book. Fifth place, she would have settled for that at the start of the day. Save something for the races tomorrow. They've got a lot of racing still to come. And what a performance from Caldwell of the USA. Sophie Caldwell leading the way into the finish straight now. Heidi Veng coming strong. What a contrast to the finish she produced in the semi-final. And Veng's not given up on this one yet. But a second lease of life for Sophie Caldwell. And the United States can claim the win here in Oberstdorf. Two metres to go. And the stretch of the wow. leg gives the victory to Caldwell, Feng in second, Osberg in third, Ingmar's daughter four, and Therese <laughs> Johaug in fifth. What a race! That what was... a race! Three Norwegians, one American, two Swedes, and it's the United States who have stolen top prize. Wow. Well done to Sophie Caldwell. Where did that come from? She has landed, absolutely landed uh, at top of the world today in sprinting. Well, there's been all sorts of controversy over whether stage wins in the World Cup uh, should count as full World Cup victories. Coldwell will be delighted that they've decided they do. And so she has one in the bag. Great racing. It'll be disappointing for Usberg has only separated herself, gained, I think, two seconds in overall Tour de Ski uh, points, if you like. So 60 for a win, 58 for second, or is it 56 for second? It's 56, 56 isn't it? 56 for second, 54 for third, 52 for fourth.
and then 50 for fifth. I think there were two places, so four seconds. So uh, Usberg could uh, head into stage five with a, what, 18 second lead. Now, the last time both Usberg and Johaug did the Alchemies, the final day of the Tour de Ski, Johaug took four and a half minutes off uh, off Usberg. <laughs> on the last day, and, 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 and Johaug is taking 45 to a minute off second place, so she knows her strength is the final day. Uh, but well done to the great Sophie Caldwell today. She came sixth at the Olympics, which was phenomenal at the time. Her, feather, her father's fair watching uh, was amazed, couldn't believe it. And so she showed her credentials then at the Olympics, and now uh, she's able to take on the world. And that more than makes up for the disappointment of Jesse Diggins crashing on the first heat. I think, yep, so the Americans will be delighted today. Yeah, they deserve, they deserve uh, a fair amount of success. They've looked good in the Tour. Uh, it's not just about one athlete, but today it is about one athlete. Sophie Caldwell, 2, 46.38, the winning time here in Obstdorf. But look at the scalps she has taken. Veg, Usberg, Johaug, Ingmar's daughter, and Nielsen. Welcome back to Obstdorf. What a victory from Sophie Caldwell. Here nice she is. strength, so I really surprised. would be doing this interview. Did you even believe you could win today? Uh, no, I was probably the last person who woke up this morning and thought this would happen. Um, I felt really good today, but skate sprinting's always been my strength, so I really surprised myself today, but I'm thrilled. <laughs> and, and coming down the final downhill, you had great skis, obviously made excellent moves. At what point did you think you had it? Um, not until I crossed the finish line, but I knew I had great skis. Um, our staff did an amazing job all day, and I'm confident in my downhill skills, so I just tried to hang on to Ingvild um, as close as possible up all the uphills and then let it rip on the downhills. <laughs> did you ever let it rip? Lots of people were checking their speed, and you just went each round. It was amazing. Congratulations. You are now the second U.S. female to ever win a World Cup. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> What a charming interview. And, uh, yeah, well-deserved, that success. She has been on the podium before. If uh, you cast your mind back to 2014, she was third in Lati. That was her PB this year, sixth in Davos, fourth in Lenzerheide, of course, at the start of the tour. But to win here, outstanding, especially up, a, up against the likes of Usberg and Vang. Incredible. And, and, and freestyle is her strength. Classic. She doesn't rate herself as highly. Well, we see that in all the, in all the stats and all the races. So she has landed big time today. Yeah, and the next time your coach says, if you want to win, you've got to believe you can win. Uh, you can say, Sophie Caldwell didn't. And I think she's absolutely <laughs> honest uh, with with that opinion uh, so difficult to think you can win when you have uh, those the Norwegians around but she's done it she's done what very few people have done this season to beat a Norwegian actually I don't think uh, anyone else other than Norwegian women have won the World Cups this that's year that's right they haven't uh, no one else has been in in the running there uh, uh, Parmakoski maybe uh, on, the, uh, on the podium but uh, but not in first place so how about that big day for the Americans and uh, as you hear, heard Jeff say only the second American win to win a World Cup Well, the drama is not quite over. We're through to the men's final, and the two big names, the two names in contention for the tour title, if, uh, if you still believe anyone other than Sumbi can win it, have made it through to this stage. And we've also got Ustiagov in there who will liven things up for the Russians. He's looked faultless so far today. Mike, uh, can Sumbi win this? I'm just thinking when Ustigov we know it's going to go as fast as Sumbi does initially, so it'll be they'll, that might affect Sumbi. And when we saw Usberg in the women's field leading everything until the final 200 meters, there is a risk of trying to lead all the time. Well, the last but I think I think sorry, I do think Sumbi can win. <laughs> the last men's semi-final, Mike, finished 13 minutes ago, and the first semi-final finished something like six minutes before that how much difference 25 percent extra rest it, it does make a difference the lactic fact, acid 30 percent if, if you finish a race and do your blood lactic levels it takes a good 20 minutes for them to drop down to fairly normal levels again Sumbi hoping to increase his lead Sebastian Eisenlauer 
He uh, timed his finish perfect to deny Pedernortuk automatic qualification, but he had to dig deep to do that. Sergei Ustigov's had a pretty easy run through so far, Mike. He's he's not been involved in anything dramatic in the finish, but he always goes out so hard, so you can't exactly say he's rested his way through the heat. Emil Everson. He's good, 24-year-old, just uh, a good all-rounder, and, and he's another one of these incredible fighters. <laughs> Ten years, he's, uh, or his tenth time on the tour, uh, he knows what how it happens, he knows where to put himself, but not quite as much on form as we have seen him in the past. So let's hope we don't have any uh, incidents on the starting line as we did with the last semi-final there. Underway, all six away well. And uh, Martin Jonsrud soon be going out very, very hard, as has his teammate Everson. And Petter Norton quite happy to sit in at the back at the moment. But uh, it doesn't look like uh, a tactical move. I think he just can't stay with the pace. And Ustiagov, just as he did in Lenzerheide, has gone out like a Russian rocket. And he is going to uh, almost certainly take the lead up the initial climb and soon be it with with that crazy pace of Ustigov uh, soon be in third place he's he's having to come up with a different strategy or is he just happy to take this within himself because his main contender is Nortug in terms of bonus seconds today yeah and I think Nortug has decided if he can beat Sunbi, he he achieves something he's not doesn't look so fussed about the win but he's uh, having been on Sunbi's heels he's now dropped at 10 15 meters behind and Sunbi absolutely <laughs> ripping this one on the first climb five Five, six, seven meters clear of Ustiakov, and he could stay clear for the rest of the race. Oh, he is head and shoulders above the rest. It's not over yet, but he's just got that ability this season to do anything. Nice cornering, little stinky step turns from Sumbi. Ustiakov just puts the brakes on a little, keeping the skis parallel, and Petr Nortuk finds himself adrift at the back of the field in sixth position. I don't think he'll finish there, but uh, he's got too much work to do, surely, to catch Sumbi as they start the second climb. Ustiakov comes again trying to challenge for the win here Sumbi did he put it all in on that first climb he may well have done but you can't tell is it a grimace or is it, is it a smile on his face <laughs> Look, all their teeth are gritting just trying to push themselves out a little harder I think Paul Turainen has played the clever the pace at the moment yeah and Paul Turainen had good skis last time round no reason to uh, suspect that his technicians haven't done the job again if he can close that five meter gap he could carry good speed over the final little footbridge here they go this is the last uphill section then it's all about double polling from here and Sumbi's on the inside line at the moment but he's squeezed out Ustiakov bullying his way through into pole position Peter Nortu completely destroyed by everybody and it's Everson of Norway who has timed this one to perfection the 24 year old with a stunning finish he's getting faster and faster <laughs> no stopping Everson he takes the win Ustiakov as he was in uh, Lenzheider in Switzerland in second place and Polteranin of Kazakhstan in third Sunbi gets four which is a little bit of light relief for Peter Nortuk who loses only two seconds to his teammate in terms of the tour standings Eisenlauer in sixth 239 couldn't do anything despite the cheers of the crowd what a race Ustigov uh, went early had he not put in that enormous burst in the opening stage Mike might have fared a little better Everson I don't think we mentioned his name until the last hundred meters and, and when the intensity especially fourth time of asking around this 1.2 kilometer if it's in safe he didn't go into this massive lactic early he held back a little not much but it pays off at the end of the race and of course the best ever day for Everson in there uh, in terms of world racing Everson who went into heat number two having qualified fourth uh, that's turned out to be a good move Polteranin went in heat two as well Ustiagov obviously in heat one Pedro Nortug raced in heat five and uh, certainly looked as though he hadn't fully recovered from the semi-final come that uh, last run round this 1200 meter course well well done to the organization dreadful conditions uh, it wasn't nearly cold enough last night to make the track solid but after three fallers on the very first heat 
Uh, they work tirelessly on the track to keep it safe. Great racing from Everson. Well, it's best uh, prior to this uh, season, seventh position in Lillehammer in the skiathlon. So two first-time winners today of World Cups. Everson for the men and Sophie Caldwell for the United States in the women's event. Well, at last, some drama in the Tour de Ski. Sumbi's still very much in control. He's going to be, what, 132 clear now after today's efforts. And still the biggest lead we've ever seen in the men's race going through this stage. Marit Bjurgen uh, was was last year at this stage of the tour she was over a minute clear of everyone uh, but in the men's it's usually 15 seconds separating the top five and this is where soon be ran out of steam he ran out of strategy as well they, they had the better line the better momentum down this hill and he's just looking around him with nothing left can you see a protest going in for Sumbi with uh, Ustia Goff cutting that corner a little sharp I didn't notice that then um, probably not well done Everton There he is, today's winner. <laughs> Nothing quite like your first World Cup win. Will it be a flash in the pan? Will he be a one-time wonder? Or is that going to be the spark that ignites his real talent? And he's got plenty of it. And when you come from a team like the Norwegians, Mike, you, you know, if you're losing World Cups, you're losing every training race to your teammates as well. So suddenly to beat Norton, to beat Sumbi is so crucial. I think so, and unhealthy for the team as well, when they're the same people dominate all the time, but the younger athletes just eating at the same table, living around the big names, their feet, they're, they're learning from them. And uh, Ibbotson shown that today, his strategy was perfect. Ustigov is the bravest man in the field to try and take it fast all the time, and he still survives. The second sprint, uh, what, well, it's five days later, for the second time, he's second. Well, just a look at the skis on each double polling action. Totally, totally committed. Can't do that forever, but over the last 100 metres, it's very, very effective. Nortugan Sumbi, little uh, team hug there. That's nice to see. But uh, body language between Nortugan right, and Sumbi. You know, I was uh, just, we just, talking, just looking uh, at that. Um, First podium, yeah. second final ever, or first final? Third, third final. Third final, yes. and the winner today. Yeah, that's amazing. I don't know what to say, but I'm really happy, really. You have so many strong teammates, and, and um, I probably most thought we would see them at the top today or whatever, and, and it's you. Yeah. Oh, it's unbelievable, but yeah, I like it. <laughs> Coming over the top of the last hill, uh, did, you, did you have the feeling, I can do this? No, I thought uh, yes, you go with the strong, but I get very good speed and yeah, good line in the finish. So yeah, yeah, you couldn't see it on TV, but uh, you had a nice gap coming into the okay. finish. So very well done. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. So a member of the Morocco Ski Club. There'll be a few celebrations there tonight in the uh, clubhouse, no doubt, and. Uh, I guess that will inspire some of the youngsters if they've seen Everson win. They'll start to think that they can win. And you just get that feeling that that Norwegian conveyor belt that just churns out top athlete after top athlete uh, is going to keep doing so for the next decade or so. Have a look at the standings. Johau now finds herself 38 seconds behind. Yes, that's with the early run out time, the qualifying time Absolutely. in there as well. Yeah, because she... Uh, got a, a, almost a 10 second lead in that so Usberg has done a bit of damage in the women's race she she's got to take it to what over a minute to have any chance on the final day I think so it'll be very interesting tomorrow on a mass start a uh, classic for the women but crucially Mike I think Usberg's efforts over the last two days of racing are making Johau dig deeper and deeper and deeper which may sap some of that hill climbing energy that we've seen in previous years quite possibly and, and, and the fact that Usberg has done it once to be able to stay the pace in the in the 10 kilometer freestyle stay with her and then pass her that's going to give confidence but I feel Usberg gave so much today and we saw her fate just like Sumbi in the final 300 couldn't quite suffer that pain anymore the discomfort 
Well, once again, let's have a look at the top of the st tour standings. Usberg Johaug only 30 seconds. Heidi Veng still in third. Remember, she's finished third in the last two years, the last two editions of the Tour de Ski. And then another minute three back to fourth position. Sophie Caldwell rockets up to 14th place with her win in the sprint here today. Great racing. And now just behind Sadie Pjornsson, who had a stumble on the qualifying and didn't get through to the knockout stages. We wouldn't have been, we wouldn't have been quite so surprised to see Bjornsson contend for the win but it's Sophie Caldwell who has stolen the honors today in Oberstdorf and there will be some uh, big celebrations in the American camp and great to see two winners Ibbotson and Caldwell for the first time winners overall World Cup standings Johaug still clear but the margin only 79 points when you consider that she's won six races plus took the, the mini tour in Ruka uh, you would have expected that margin to be a little bit bigger but uh, it looks as though the season is shaping out to be a battle between Johaug and Usberg. Caldwell now 17th with the 50 points uh, that she'll win from the sprint today. And no day off tomorrow. They're back in action. Let's have a look at the timings. Uh, 1300 UK time for the start of the mass start. Well, that wraps up our coverage from uh, Oberstdorf. Despite the snow conditions, Mike, some of the best sprinting we've seen this year. Fantastic. The conditions, you know, the difficult conditions for me make it even more exciting. It's a little unpredictable. So again, Norway taking uh, pole position in the Tour de Ski. Usberg and Sumbi still the tour leaders as we head to stage five.